We're very grateful today uh, at the Nathanson Center and Osgoode Hall Law School to have with us Professor James Stewart, who is a professor at the uh, Faculty of Law at the University of, of British uh, Columbia. Uh, and also, I, I don't know if I have this in the bio here, but I seem to have read online that you're a, you're a fellow of some organization in the U.S. How's a fellow at NYU? Uh, how's our fellow in the U.S.? Uh, and, and that's where you are this year, is it? Uh, last semester. Last semester. Last okay, semester. okay. So I just didn't want to miss this. But uh, so, so uh, somebody who's traveled a lot, uh, Professor Stewart, uh, has been uh, an associate in law at Columbia Law School uh, in, in New York, where he also completed his, his, his doctorate. Uh, and he's taught at Columbia, he's taught at Queen's University uh, and at the University of, uh, of Geneva. Uh, and uh, he's also been a um, um, professor, uh, sorry, um, an appeals counsel with the prosecution of the United Nations uh, International Criminal F uh, Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. He's also worked for the legal division of the International Committee of the Red Cross as well as the prosecution of the International Cr Criminal Tribunal for, for Rwanda. So, so really the, the ubermensch of international criminal law we have with us today. Um, and his research interests include international criminal law, laws of armed conflict, international human rights, uh, comparative criminal law, theory of criminal law, public international law, counterterrorism, corporate criminal liability, corporate responsibility for international crimes, and the Great Lakes region of Africa. So this is, this is, uh, Quite phenomenal that you're here with us today. Uh, we're, we're very pleased indeed to um, to have a chance to, to to hear you present a paper on accomplices liability of arms vendor, a, a conceptual um, defense. And 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 I would know that Professor Stewart left Vancouver this morning at 5 a.m. and uh, following this talk is going to fly back to Vancouver. So this is quite a super erogatory act to be here with us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Francois. Um, should I speak for half an hour? And, and if people have That's questions wonderful. at any point, feel free to. Do, do you have um, the microphone? Or the... Um, I can put this on if you'd like. No. So this is one of the first times that I've presented a piece of work that is still very much in the works. It's a, a project that is a little bit like an onion that's been unfolding. I, I've spent um, the last several years thinking firstly about theories of complicity and the way they relate to international crimes, thinking about causation and overdetermined causes precisely because they relate to issues uh, that I'm about to speak to today, thinking about corporate criminal theory because I'm interested in the responsibility of corporations who sell weapons um, and other uh, sorts of commodities in conflict zones. And this is the continuation of that long narrative. It's a, a project that I hope to complete in the next um, three or four months. I always start these sorts of talks by trying to situate it a little bit so people get some background about how all of these long lists of seemingly disjoint and crazy uh, academic in interests come about and intersect in this paper. Um, I'm most interested in corporate responsibility for international crimes, and by international crimes I mean genocide, crimes against humanity, and, and war crimes. Uh, there's a, a short backstory to it. I, um, as Francois mentioned, used to, to work on prosecution cases in different international criminal tribunals, um, both one in Rwanda and one in the former Yugoslavia. And it was really my experiences in Rwanda that were the inspiration for this work. Um, the very short version of that is that I became extremely interested in atrocities in the Democratic Republic of Congo just across the border when I was in Rwanda. It seemed strange that we were engaged in prosecuting and lamenting what was happening in Rwanda when exactly the same things were happening just across the border that were actual, uh, actually a continuity with the Rwandan genocide itself. Um, so I, I followed with interest goings on uh, in the DRC. And uh, I came across this report, which was the culmination of three years' worth of investigation by a UN panel of experts that was established by the Security Council. And to make a long story short, they have at the end of their um, final report this triangular diagram, which depicts or attempts to depict the um, nature of forces that sustain armed violence in that region and producing 4.3 excess civilian deaths since 1998. Um, and the triangular doc, uh, diagram has as its apex continuation of armed violence characterized by egregious human rights violations. But then in the two peripheries, it has commercial activities that are carried out at, with the assistance of Western businesses. The first is illegal exploitation of natural resources, which provides the finance necessary for illicit weapons transactions. 
And this creates a sort of a, what I describe as a vicious triangle where anyone who is aggrieved in the region, and there are very many people, can exploit diamonds, gold, tin, coltan, to buy weapons, to wage war, to produce more human rights violations, and it produces this downward spiral into darkness. One of the things that struck me reading this report and looking at this diagram, immediately I was working on appellate cases for the prosecution in um, Yugoslavia at the time, is that we as international prosecutors focus too much on the apex of the triangle. We focus too much on rape and torture and murder once a conflict has run its course. Better to intervene by focusing on the two uh, peripheries of the triangle and deal with the sorts of commercial input that can have an effect on the trajectory of the way the conflict and atrocity plays out. In this project that I want to talk to you about now, I want to deal with one of those peripheries, and that is the arms vending. The idea that for the longest period, people have been selling weapons to notoriously brutal regimes uh, in complete uh, impunity, absent any real uh, framework or accountability whatsoever. But I want to deal with the core, very basic idea in criminal theory, and that is if I sell you a weapon and you use it to commit a crime, under what circumstance am I also responsible for the crime that you have perpetrated? So this project is very much dealing with that core basic idea and to foreshadow work that will come later where I put on my other hat as an international lawyer. My aspirations are to think about this relationship then to elevate into the international and extrapolate across the arms industry and the arms trade generally. But let me tell you a little bit about this core idea. And as soon as I embark on this analysis, something very strange and incongruous occurs to me. There's this conflict between my two academic sides, the international law side and the criminal theory side. So in the international realm, complicity is the darling of everyone who is attempting to hold corporations responsible, especially for human rights. So the UN Global Compact uses complicity as a basis for determining when corporations are responsible. Um, John Ruggie, the Harvard professor who has led this long process about corporate responsibility for human rights, is complicity is front and center in that analysis. Complicity is front and center also in Alien Tort Claims Act uh, decisions within the United States. And all of this analysis is borrowing from this basic criminal notion. But in contrast, all the criminal theorists in many different jurisdictions, from George Fletcher to Anthony Duff to um, Andrew Ashworth to Klaus Broxson, all of these people in different jurisdictions have grave misgivings about the application of complicity during the ordinary course of business. The part of my ambition in this project is to side with the human rights people but to try and couch that um, position within criminal theory terms, to highlight where I think in some places criminal theorists have gone wrong and some of those mistakes I think are very um, easy to explain away. Some are more difficult and some of them relate to um, core problems and how complicity might function both domestically and internationally. Let me tell you a little bit about what I want to do. Feel free to interrupt at any, at any point. Um, but what I want to do first is introduce to you what my theory of complicity is and the, the operative, um, excuse me, let me start that again. I want to first give you three core examples because I feel like the core examples illustrate basic moral principles and that sometimes it's helpful to focus on international criminal justice to highlight these core moral principles because it is by definition so extreme um, and the extremity sometimes helps elucidate it precisely it is what it is that's going on. So I have three core examples that I want to mention briefly. Uh, then I want to speak also very briefly about my notion of complicity. Uh, it relates to work that I've completed in the past. Um, I'm hoping we can keep that to the side just a little bit, but I, my, I suspect that we won't be able to because it relates very directly to the core issues that I'm trying to flesh out in this piece. And that is to deal explicitly with Eight of the core problems which the criminal theorists say mean complicity cannot function in a business dimension the way that the human rights people are proposing it should. I mean, admittedly, the criminal theorists and the human rights people have no conversation. They don't know that there's this disagreement. 
So I want to first set out what these eight points of disagreement are and why criminal theorists have such misgivings about this relationship. Um, I can speak about any, about uh, my tentative solutions to some of them, but I have four that I'd be very interested to discuss with you to uh, see if I can garner some thinking and, and some debate around four that I think are especially difficult. So that's a little overview of, of where we're going. Let me give you my, my three examples that illustrate different uh, things that I think we can draw on as we move forward. So during the Second World War, a, a German company um, producing the asphyxiant Zyklon B sold prodigious amounts to the SS. And they sold these amounts knowing that the asphyxiant, this chemical, was going directly to Auschwitz. And at the end of the Second World War, uh, they were prosecuted as accomplices, saying, listen, you, you provided this vast quantities of uh, this particular chemical, and you were perfectly aware of what it was going to be used for. You share some degree of responsibility for the consequences of these particular actions. You share responsibility with the people who actually pulled the lever and released the gas into gas chambers because you played some causal, important causal role in the way this genocide uh, played out. The second example is a little bit more controversial um, and and interesting for criminal theory and, and theory of complicity in different ways. And that is a case that's presently on appeal uh, in international criminal law, and that's the, the, the case involving Charles Taylor, the once uh, president of Liberia. And Charles Taylor, Taylor at, at first instance, was convicted of rape for supplying weapons to a notoriously brutal rebel group in Sierra Leone that uses these weapons in part to commit rapes, as well as amputations and all sorts of other terrible crimes. Rape is interesting, though, because it talks about the relationship, the causal relationship between the crime and complicity. Of course, Charles Taylor didn't physically commit rape at all, but he is held responsible for it, and I think that's an interesting uh, proposition. My last, my last uh, example is an individual called Victor Bout, who is a, a former KGB agent, also dubbed the Merchant of Death, if you've seen the movie. Lords of War, it's loosely based on, on Victor Bout, and he was so above the law, Victor Bout, for the best part of 15 years that he helped collaborate in the making of the movie. So Victor Bout had this policy that he would sell weapons to anyone, absolutely anyone. He sold weapons to both sides during the Angolan Civil War uh, that killed at least 500,000 people. He sold weapons to Al-Qaeda, and he sold um, weapons to the United States in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, allegedly. He was ultimately tried and caught in a very big political um, coup. When the US FBI staged a sting operation in Thailand, and they posed as members of the Colombian rebel group, the FARC, and said, listen, hey, would you, would you sell us stinger missiles to shoot down American civil airlines? He says, sure, I could get you Stinger air, air missiles, no problem whatsoever. I, I like about example is, is problematic for a number of reasons. But you see in interviews, he says, listen, and this is a theme that pervades some of the criminal theory that we're about to address. Listen, um, I'm entitled to rely on the agency of my recipients. And um, I am just providing weapons. Uh, it is their choice what they do with weapons. I have no vested interest in what they do with their weapons. I'm just making money. I use these, these um, cases as touchstones to come back to when the criminal theory gets especially dense. Um, and there's two propositions that arise from that I want to put on the table at the outset. First, take the Zyklon B case. If Hitler comes to you and you are the only supplier of chemicals in this quantity sufficient to kill this number of people, I use that example because I think counterfactual dependence makes it easier, it is first a moral decision about whether you make the transfer. And second, I think the consequences of the transfer matter to the moral decision. So if your chemicals are going to be used uh, to exterminate large numbers of people, I think that use and that consequence matters to the morality of the decision. And I'll come back to these ideas as we proceed. Let me tell you a little bit about my, uh, the view of complicity that I'm using to process these uh, thoughts about business. And as I say, this relates to work that I, I've um, spent some considerable time doing previously. Um, and it's controversial. It's controversial because 
Um, what I advocate for is a vision of complicity that collapses into a more capacious notion of perpetration. So in effect, complicity, complicity disappears. It disappears along with all other modes of participation, like instigation, joint criminal enterprise. Um, this seems controversial for many Anglo-Americans and, and Germans for that matter, but it is the system that's in place in Austria, Brazil, Denmark, and Italy. So just to make this clear, in much of the debates that I'm interested in in, in extant doctrine, there is a strong debate about whether an accomplice should have the purpose to facilitate the crime, i.e. you can't hold Bout responsible for crimes in Angola. He just wanted to make money. He didn't want, in a strong volitional sense, people to be killed in Angola. Then there's a whole group of people saying, well, knowledge should be the standard for the mental element. And knowledge would capture someone like Victor Bout because although he may not have wanted in a strong volitional sense, he was most certainly indifferent to that and he had a cognitive component which was a strong, almost certain recognition that very serious crimes would arise from this. The third argument that, that is associated with people like Sandy Kaddish and others is use of recklessness um, in complicity. My, my work previous to this has said that, all, that none of those mental elements is conceptually defensible because they're all static. By that it means each of them remains constant as the mental element in the crime with which they will blame the accomplice is dynamic. So for instance, the big problem with this in, in international criminal law is if you have recklessness as an element of complicity and a strong purpose in genocide, the purpose to destroy in whole or in part, it creates this communicative dissonance between the two. It means that in certain instances, you can be held responsible for genocide because complicity makes you responsible for the ultimate crime. It's a, a means of participating in the ultimate crime, even though you didn't have the quintessential mental element that is consistent with what it means to be a genocidaire, which is announced in the crime. So the unitary theory deals with this problem by saying mental element for the accomplice and every other participant in this crime must be exactly that announced in the crime. And so the mental element for complicity is no longer static, it's dynamic. It is deferential to that announced in the crime with which the accomplice should be convicted. That means for this particular project that I have to be able to account for all of those mental elements, purpose, knowledge, recklessness, because in some circumstances, some international crimes can be perpetrated through recklessness. In others, intention is the standard, and in others, there's an ulterior intention like purpose. So in a sense, I have to account for all of those, but recklessness is by far the most problematic, and I'll, I'll come back to show you why that's the case momentarily. There's also an interesting debate about the causal, whether accomplices have to make causal contributions. Um, and there are a series of very famous people like Hart and Honoré who say, listen, the agency of the perpetrator is a wild card and it intervenes in causal processes that the accomplice may have initiated or, or assisted with such that the accomplice can never be in a position to make a causal contribution to the perpetrator's crime. I've always found that uh, sharply counterintuitive and uh, Michael Moore's work has done a great deal, I think, to suggest that um, that view of uh, causal intervening causes is, is not sound metaphysically, and I, I'm much more convinced by Moore than by Hard and Honoré. Um, this relates also to work that Chris Coots has done, where Chris Coots tries to deal with problems of um, overdetermination by creating common intentions. So he moves into the mental realm. A unitary theory would just say, this and this is a causal contribution also of some intensity. So ultimately, all of this boils down to, for a unitary theory of perpetration, you make a causal contribution to the crime, you have the mental element required for the crime, you are responsible for that crime, we determine different degrees of participation and moral culpability for that crime at the stage of sentencing. I'll say more about that as we move through what are, for me now in this project, really the core problems. So. There are eight that I think are core problems for criminal theorists. The first is that, and most of these focus around com 
the function of reckless complicity, which is the lowest standard in the theory that I've embraced, which will apply in some circumstances, but not all. The first is, listen, this standard stymies business. Business people need to be taking risks, and the nature of entrepreneurial risks is you have to be able to be in a position where you produce commodities and rely on people's ability to make autonomous decisions for themselves. The potential floodgates argument by creating risk liability for producing products um, and um, downstream consequences is potentially very significant. And in a way, this is precisely the concern that drives the standard that is applicable in the model penal code in the United States is they have this long debate and they say, listen, um, if we do this, it's going to have very serious consequences for business. Let's have purpose as the static standard across all um, complicity situations. So you have, again, the, the situation where you say to Victor Bout, listen, your purpose was just to make money. Therefore, we wash your hands of any responsibility. Um, that is very much the ambition of the model penal code uh, in its first um, negotiations and discussions. The next is, I think, for most criminal theorists and, and most of the ones we all know love, is the central is the central issue, and I, I it's one that I take particular issue with. All of these criminal theorists, from George Fletcher to um, Duff to Andrew Ashworth, they all take the position that accomplice liability of merchants is like omission liability. The idea is that, listen, I'm operating in my shop, and every day someone comes in, gives me 10 bucks, I give them a weapon. 10 bucks gives me a weapon. And I keep distributing weapons on this normal sort of basis. And so holding me responsible for the acts that result in specific, in, uh, in specific manifestations of this phenomenon is actually holding me responsible for failing to break from my normal course of action. Um, I, I want to say more about this momentarily. I just want to uh, highlight that this is the issue. And this is really the dominant thinking about uh, why um, complicity doesn't function in these situations. For me, it, it's, um, it's unconvincing, and I, I feel like it's actually a misinterpretation of Fletcher that everyone else followed. Clearly, weapons don't sell themselves, right? I mean, somebody is acting in this scenario, and uh, I develop a typology uh, that I think explains why this is morally unsound in a moment. To go back to the mental element, and again, I, I'm talking about recklessness because it's the lowest standard. So Glanville Williams has this wonderful, uh, professor at Cambridge has this wonderful um, criticism of recklessness as a possible standard for complicity across the board, where he says it leads to blank check liability. The idea is that in a weapons scenario, you're selling something that's inherently dangerous. And so I sell you the weapon, and then suddenly I'm on the hook for any possible crime that's committed with this weapon for its entire lifetime. It's like writing someone a blank check to hold you responsible for things, um, which he thinks is, is obviously perverse. He also is concerned that this is um, invading basic ideas of, of autonomy and, and liberalism. Um, in a modern society by creating, by making merchants unpaid auxiliary policemen, where these merchants have some role in policing and vetting the people who um, are going to purchase weapons for them. And for me, both of these arguments, I think, uh, proceed on a, a fallacious understanding of um, recklessness, but I'd like to say more about that too. The next one, which is surprisingly common, and this relates to a significant project that I, I just finished on, on causation, is this. And at least two of my examples use this excuse. Both in the Zyklon B case and Victor Bout say, listen, if I didn't do this, someone else would. And I think they're right. I think if they didn't do it, someone else would. I think almost invariably they're right. And so that is a very common uh, moral excuse for these types of systemic uh, behaviors where there is some other sufficient cause capable of um, ensuring that these sorts of acts uh, take place regardless. I can say more about that briefly. The next is, listen, this is just these uh, contributions of arms vendors are just not proximate. Um, so in Anglo-American thinking, we have factual causation. So you're sure these arms vendors made a factual contribution, but so did your grandparents, by, so did the perpetrator's grandparents by um, deciding to have children made a factual contribution 
causally to the crime. In Anglo-American systems, we have something we give different names called legal causation, which is an attempt to pass out and exclude things that are remote to bizarre or um, simply unfair. And armed vendors, arms vendors surely fit within that category. They're far too distant from the crime uh, and in that sense not responsible. A similar notion in German theory, which they, uh, which they describe as normative attribution, does similar sorts of work. And part of the criticism is that weapons vendors will fall within that category. I think that uh, response is, is also far too hard and fast. Also in German criminal theory is something that relates in a peripheral way to um, discussions in, of omissions in um, Anglo-American theory is something that they call neutral acts. And what's surprising about neutral acts is it's a massive literature. And what makes an, an act uh, neutral is first that it's commonplace. It's, it's very much uh, a regular occurrence within a society. And it's neutral also in the sense that there's no identity between the accomplice, uh, there's, there's no identity of purpose between the accomplice and the perpetrator. So they are effective, effectively autonomous independent agents uh, pursuing different sorts of agendas. Um, I'm also very skeptical of, of neutral acts and I, I want to share some one aspect which I think is um, which I can, an argument which I can make in a very strong way and another one I feel like I need to make very gently in a political way because I feel like in part neutral acts is such a major issue in German criminal theory because it deals with the accomplice liability of ordinary citizens for the Holocaust. I'll say more. Seventh idea is that, listen, complicity is not the right doctrine for this job. You shouldn't be appealing to notions in the general part of, of criminal law. What you should be looking to is separate legislation. So if you're really concerned about people selling weapons in Angola, you should have, should have separate legislation that says you can't sell weapons in Angola. Um, if you're really concerned about selling weapons to Al-Qaeda, likewise. I also disagree with this um, for reasons that I think uh, it leads to over-criminalization and doesn't go to the heart of the core moral issue. The last one, a lot of criticisms, right? The last one is that this leads to ridiculous analogies in different fields. Take, for instance, and most of these I get from Glanville Williams too. Um, take, for instance, the automobile industry. In many places apart from the United States, automobiles kill more people than guns, right? Automobiles are very dangerous things. So if recklessness is sufficient com for complicity and being a merchant isn't too remote, then suddenly you're in a position where you're, what, criminalizing the whole car industry? Surely that's overreach. Surely that doesn't work. Um, likewise, another uh, memorable example from Glenn for Williams is, you know, so Agatha Christie, right? Does anyone know Agatha Christie? She's this wonderful um, mystery murder writer. She came up with crazy, brilliant ways of killing people in her novels that people copied in, real, in the real world. And he's saying, well, so what, Agatha Christie is responsible for the murders that result because she... Surely she knew there was a risk that these mad people out there will copy these sorts of crimes. It was a substantial risk potentially. It happens for every one of her novels. Um, is she responsible for those murders? Surely not. Williams says this is ridiculous. So those are the eight problems and, and part of my work over the summer is to elaborate on intuitive, what are presently, um, for some, intuitive answers to these questions. Others are, are more uh, developed. If I can, the time, um, Foswa, I'm, I'm going to mention what I think are two easy answers to these questions and then put on the table four that I think are difficult and, and invite discussion uh, on these topics. So the first two easy ones, um, the idea that this stymies business and that, that um, business is the main, should be the main concern in the way we think about complicity, I think is um, backwards. It concerns me that quite conspicuously in the context of the US model penal code that a very consequentialist agenda based on businesses should be trumping core moral principles about what we think it means to be an accomplice. That seems to me to, to privilege capitalism over moral principle. Better know 
to front load a deontologically defensive notion of what it means to be an accomplice, and then let responsibility lie, responsibility lie where it may, which most certainly may be within a corporate structure. Most certainly, there's nothing um, ontologically privileged about a corporation such that they can't be assisting crimes um, in the sorts of ways that we're concerned about, and quite the contrary, I think there are. So for me, that this, this very consequentialist agenda that it seems to be driving complicity in lots of places and the privileged place of business in these narratives, uh, I think is um, unfortunate. Likewise, the, the argument about overdetermination, and this is a, a project that I spent some considerable time dealing with, I think almost everybody real, uh, agrees that um, in a firing squad, if there are eight people in a firing squad and all fires a bullet at a particular individual to kill them. Um, any one of these individuals could defect and say, listen, I, I refuse to be part of this. The person is still going to die and therefore there's no counterfactual dependence, but there's no real doubt that each person who participates in the firing squad is responsible for the death. What surprised me in doing this project is how difficult it is to arrive at a conceptually defensible notion of holistic notion of complicity that encapsulates that. But part of this project is just to reiterate the different attempts at doing it, uh, including a necessary element of a sufficient set causation, including um, attempting to craft the precise event um, very precisely in order to say, well, this person made a difference to the, the, the person firing the gun made a difference to the crime as it transpired, and various other solutions, which I think are where we are at. So I, I personally think that is one of the weakest um, solutions. If I didn't do it, somebody else would. I, I don't think that is meaningful. Let me talk to you about what I think is the, the big mistake in the way criminal theorists have been addressing this, and that is this analogy with emission liability. And again, the argument is that in the ordinary course of business, you make an emission by selling someone uh, a weapon that is subsequently used for a genocide or any other crime. I think that that is Clearly wrong, I think you are acting. And if I were to reduce this, my argument into a moral slogan, it would be something like, everyone has the obligation to break from habitual practices when, because of a change of circumstances, a specific instantiation will lead to a crime. And that is acting, not omitting. And I, I'm not sure if it's really important to belabor the point. I'm not sure how controversial it really is, but I develop a typology of, of how this looks and I have four variants. The first variant is um, one that modifies where the change of circumstances is in, the, is in the surrounding circumstances. So every night you come home from work and you light a fire. One night you come home and there's a massive gas leak. It is criminal to, light, to attempt to light your fire. There will be an explosion. That's not an omission, it's an action. A change in the status of the primary actor. So you have normal sexual relations with your partner, then you contract HIV. The change of circumstances matters in terms of calculating moral um, responsibility for continuing to have sex normal sexual relations with your partner without disclosing. A change in circumstances of the secondary actor. So you, each week you have a dinner, you invite people to come and sample your wonderful chicken with peanut sauce. And on one particular week, the person arrives at your house and says, I have a peanut allergy and I will die. Not changing your usual pattern of behavior is criminal. It's an action that is criminal. And finally, a change of, in the means uh, where you normally, as a doctor, prescribe medicines to a particular person. You have this particular medicine, but you know it's three years out of date change in circumstances in the, in the medicine, you prescribe it anyway because it's part of your ordinary course of behavior. It caused significant harm. I don't think it's an omission. I think it's an action. I don't think any of these variants change when you add an intermediary to them such that it's constructed as complicity, not perpetration. I don't think it matters if you are the person selling matches to, to the person in, who lights their, their fire each night. I think it's exactly the same moral problem. Um, I, I don't think it's a convincing argument. What is interesting though is the, and here's where I, I start to think about um, things that are actually difficult uh, in the next little while. The first is the salience of normalcy. And in both these omissions uh, arguments that we see from these people and in much of the literature on neutral acts that animates German theorists, 
there's this idea that, listen, it's unfair to hold people responsible for behaviors that are normal generally. And my in initial reaction as someone who's involved in international criminal law, and again, I think this might be helpful in elucidating the point, yeah, but in some instances, what is normal is pathological. In some instances, what is normal is psychotic. And it's precisely the ways in which international criminal justice deals with these sorts of problems because these sorts of criminal behaviors have become normal within a society. But this leads to problems, and I'm in the process of fleshing out these problems. The first is, but that means that criminal law is no longer about, about sanctioning and punishing deviance. And people like Anthony Duff have this interesting criticism that international criminal justice can't really work in its international guise because there's no surrounding community of values within uh, from which punishment can arise. That there's no, uh, the international community isn't sufficiently robust in terms of identity to couch this, uh, to, to ground this type of punishment. Um, that is, I think, interesting. Douglas Husack also has this uh, interesting paper entitled something like the but everybody is doing that defense. And within this paper, he's talking about the ways in which um, that type of argument may f fail to satisfy various components of um, blame attribution generally. Um, my intuition is that that can't be especially meaningful, but I'm interested in people's thoughts about um, how you would process those sorts of problems. You want me to keep going, or you want to? I, I can. Should I put? Let me put a few problems on the table, and you can pick and choose from what you what you want to. The second problem is um, the mental element in its recklessness guise. So, to reiterate, I, I don't commit to recklessness across the board. I commit to a dynamic standard which is deferential to whatever that is announced in the crime with which the accomplice will be accomplice will be convicted. And in many instances, because crimes contemplate recklessness, I have to account for recklessness uh, within the uh, rubric of accomplice liability. Now, take Victor Bout. Victor Bout, uh, let me introduce the problem a, a little bit more clearly. So there's a problem about just supporting general criminal offenses as opposed to specific criminal offenses. And in Victor Bout, Bout's case, and say Victor Bout in Angola, he's selling weapons to terribly brutal regimes, right, who are killing themselves in the most intense ways, and civilians in spectacular ways. And so for me, there's no doubt that, that there is some degree of moral culpability in this transaction. Uh, it does, and let's try and process it through the, the realm of recklessness and, and culpable risk taking. Victor Bout has no idea what the precise crime is that results with his weapons. He has no idea. He is completely indifferent to it and is never um, turns his mind to this particular AK-47 being used to kill this particular individual at this particular time. His, his comprehension of the system is much more general. But if it's just general, how is that different from the person selling cars? Because their understanding is, is general. And my response intuitively at this point it wants to be, listen, both automobile vendors and arms vendors are responsible when there is something specific that alerts them to the fact that there is a, a real risk that goes beyond the generic criminogenic propensities of the merchandise that they're selling. There's something specific that says, listen, this is a dangerous object and you kind of look like, or you kind of, you know, this recent evidence that from the United States that one ammunitions vendor refused to sell ammunition to a particular individual who went on a massacre in the United States because their conduct was too erratic. Um, there has to be something specific that alerts you to the fact that this is highly dangerous. And if that happens in the context of an automobile sale or in the context of a weapons sale, I'm good with it. Or in a context of um, any other of the scenarios that we are discussing. The difficulty is, I think in many instances that are deeply culpable, there may not be that evidence. Um, I'm not sure how that plays out in the sorts of paradigmatic examples that I'm, I'm interested in. There may be. Another of the solutions that I'm thinking about tentatively is, is trying to ascribe to recklessness a more normative function that focuses a little bit like the model penal code in the United States 
on whether the conduct was reasonable in the circumstances, um, reasonable relative to normal commercial practices. This is difficult because it oscillates between objective and subjective views of, of um, recklessness, which I am conscious have been the bane of, of much discussion, in, particularly in Britain. Um, but my sense is that there uh, must be some coherent understanding of how these dynamics play out. Let me add one more layer to this, which I think is especially important in the way I'm thinking about this. That is, a lot of people are up in arms about reckless complicity, particularly Glanville Williams and many other people saying, wow, this is just going to be vast in amplitude. But I take seriously an idea by Sandy Kaddish, which I, th I find very compelling, and that is that reckless complicity does not chill normal social interactions or, or stymie the way people operate in a society any more than recklessness already does. So to paraphrase, and, uh, to, to take you in two steps analytically, first, blank check responsibility is already a problem of recklessness. And second, the problem with the scenario is not a problem with complicity, it's a problem with recklessness. Um, so part of what I'm hoping to do for the next four months is to think about these issues in, in ways that try and flesh out to what extent uh, this, is a, this is a plausible um, account of complicity and how it might function specifically. Shall I say, let me say one last thing about the separate legislation argument. So the argument in separate legislation to recall is, listen, if you're concerned about Angola or Al-Qaeda or anything like that, you should have a separate crime that says it is a crime to sell weapons to uh, Angolans. But I'm interested in the ways in which this is over-criminalized because um, it's over-criminalized because it effectively precludes the freedom to sell weapons to Angolans in situations where they do not use them to commit atrocities. So a lot of the discourse in, in over-determined, uh, over-criminalization is we shouldn't be criminalizing things like speeding, which are inherently risky, better to focus on the sorts of uh, problems where people actually cause accidents and the deterrent value can flow backwards such that people make their own decisions about whether they speed or not, knowing their capabilities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And by the same token, I think specific legislation is morally problematic because it doesn't get to the heart of the core issue, which is a general issue about moral responsibility for helping other people commit crimes. Um, and I feel that people should be able to acquire weapons. Weapons sell, uh, serve all sorts of uh, important issues, including in Angola and elsewhere. It's just when those weapons are used, it's just when those weapons have causal impact in international crimes that we should be especially concerned. There are a range of other pragmatic reasons why this framing is, is important, but I confess that um, my first order concern is um, trying to reach some morally defensible notion of, of complicity and apply it within a corporate context in, in ways that um, answer some of the, the criminal theorists that I've pointed to. So maybe I'll stop, Francois, from, from talking there. I, I've, um, I've said a great deal. I think there's a lot on the table. So let's open the discussion to the floor. I mean, I, I'm smiling at Victor Tadros there because on last Friday he presented to us a paper on overdetermination. So, uh -huh. so I can't imagine that he will not have anything to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Victor, why don't, why don't you kick us off? I'd ask you if you have a question to just use the microphone and please just jump in whatever question you have. We're uh, very democratic in this way here. Hello. So, uh, thanks for the paper. Sure. There's loads of stuff on the table. So, sure. I, uh, and I agree with a lot of it. And I think the, right, uh, the answer is broadly the right one. Um, so, I'm pretty skeptical about some of the arguments against complicity that, that have been put by some of the theorists that you're also skeptical about. I think all of that is, is along the right lines. The emissions argument is just hopeless. <laughs> I can't believe anyone takes it seriously. I mean, so so you get this case of the normal course of conduct. So, you know, so I say, you know, I, I, I teach a kid's school and um, I teach them the hurdles, so I say jump, 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 and then I see this kid standing on a cliff, and it's an omission if I shout jump. <laughs> I mean, really? Yeah. <laughs> Does anyone think that? I mean, that just seems crazy. <laughs> so, so that, that argument just seems completely hopeless. Yeah. 
um, the, the, the recklessness thing, again, I mean, you know, so ruling out recklessness altogether from complicity liability, just completely hopeless. I mean, you can't believe anyone takes it seriously. Is that the same or why? Well, let's think about the case where I'm, where, uh, so there's different kinds of recklessness, it might be worth distinguishing them. So there's one kind of case where um, I provide you with a gun and I'm uncertain about whether you're going to use the gun to go um, hunting foxes or hunting people. Mm. That's the weaker case of complicity, I think. Mm -hmm. And then there's the stronger case of complicity where I provide you with a gun, and I'm not sure whether you're going to go and carry out a murder with the gun, but if you use the gun, you're definitely going to carry out a murder with it. Mm -hmm. So the only reason why you want the gun is to carry out the murder, but you're just unsure whether you're actually going to go and do it, and you want the gun just in case you decide to do it. Mm -hmm. In that second case, it's crazy to think that I'm not complicit mm -hmm. in the murder where I'm unsure whether you're going to carry it out, but I know that the only reason why you want the gun is to commit the murder. Does anyone really think in that case, well, I'm just doing it for the money, that I'm not complicit? I mean, that's, that's, One of the things I, I wonder, crazy. though, is that whether if you couch uh, recklessness too high, it just breaks into, it break, breaks into oblique intention. So it breaks into a scenario where you don't have a strong volitional component vis-a-vis -vis the end product, but you are aware that it's a virtual certainty. It's a bit like bombing the air, the, bombing the airport because you hate one of the people in the airport and you say well, listen I, I didn't intend to intend in a volitional sense to kill everyone else around me but i just knew it was a inevitable consequence that's not true in my kind of case so you get the case where you think your wife's cheating on you and so you say to me i want to get hold of a gun because if i find out that she's cheating on me i'm going to shoot her and the lover right and so i say i'll provide you with the gun Right. And that's the only reason why you've got the right, gun, right, I know right, that, but right, I'm unsure right. whether she's cheating on you. That's a good point. So you're unsure whether you're going to find out the, 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 the right result so, or not, so right. I don't know whether so you're going to Is it because, because the gun. risk is higher in that case? That there's that no that? other reason for me to provide you with the gun. I mean, with the Fox's case, where, to make you, money. where you might, you know, I might think, look, so I can justify that on the grounds that there's good reason for me to provide people with guns to kill Foxes, and then there's this risk you're going to use them for some other stuff. Mm. But in the, the kind of reckless case I'm thinking of here, the only reason why you want the gun is to go and commit the crime. I'm not sure whether you're going to commit it, mm. but that's the only reason why you want the gun. There's no other reason for me to provide you with the gun. So that's a really strong case where you've got recklessness, mm. and that should surely be sufficient for complicity. I'd be very surprised if, when presented with that case, those people that deny that recklessness is sufficient would say, no, no complicity no, in that no, kind no. of case. I, just, I find that very hard to believe. Let me say I like all of that. Mm. And that overdetermination, I'm a bit worried there. There are some cases where um, overdetermination has got to be sufficient to rule out complicity. Here's my example. Imagine that I run a, uh, a, a firm which produces baseball bats, and uh, everything goes pretty well, we made lots of money, and then uh, I find out that my baseball bats being nice and shiny are the weapon of choice for the mob. So they're using my baseball bats to kill people. And um, it's impossible for me to distinguish mobsters from non-mobsters. And I know that if they don't use my baseball bats, they're going to use other people's baseball bats. And if they don't use other people's baseball bats, they're going to use table legs. Whatever, you know, the, the amount of killing is going to be exactly the same. It's going to make no difference if I refrain from selling baseball bats. So it's like the cost for me to refrain from selling baseball bats is pretty high. I'm going to close down my whole business. And that's all I can do. There's nothing else I can do other than close down my business if I'm going to prevent my baseball bats being used in these killings. And if I do do that, no one's going to be any better off because they're going to kill with other weapons. In that case, I find it very hard to believe that I should be complicit and I should refrain from selling the bats. I'd love to talk to you more and I'd love to send you this paper that I've written on overdetermined atrocities. Um, it strikes me as an interesting example and I agree that it's problematic, but it seems like we might be uh, washing the baby out with the bathwater because in a vast majority of situations, it's insufficient to be saying, listen, somebody else would have done this, even if it's true. Yeah, so um, I agree with that, so you so, need to find out how to pass these cases. Some cases where it's permissible, some cases where it's wrong to do something where the result's overdetermined. Right. So we need to be careful about how we pass these cases. But to say, overdetermination is never. Overdetermination is never part of the answer. Right. I mean, sometimes overdetermination makes a significant difference to what we're allowed to do. Let, let, me, um, let me offer a reflection on your example. I'm tempted to to process that as a problem of general versus specific intent. Like, in that instance, it seems, strikes me like, <laughs> no pun intended, strikes me that the baseball bats are like automobiles. 
they have a general propensity to, towards crime and you have no specific intent, you have no specific awareness of how and when your conduct will assist specific um, instances of crime. It's a general uh, component uh, that can, your products can be used to. If that is the standard for criminal responsibility, you have to shut down all sorts of industries. You have to shut down the arms industry for, for certain because um, they have general criminogenic properties that we all know about. You certainly have to shut down the automobile uh, industry. So I'm not sure that that can be a reasonable understanding of recklessness. But the gen I mean, the general thing seems to me sufficient in some cases to justify liability. Mm. I and mean, think about it, imagine that I start selling Rehypnol, the date rape drug. I agree. I provide all these people with Rehypnol. Yeah, yeah, I don't I know who's going to be raped and when exactly, but the only reason why anyone wants Rehypnol is to go rape people. So I clearly I'm complicit. The fact that I don't know exactly who. Isn't that intention though? Isn't that my oblique intention? No, I just want to make money out of the Rehypnol. So I, uh, and you but, can even imagine the case where I'm not sure whether so you've got recklessness. You know, so, right, right, so, right. so Rehypnol I sell, you know, if it's, someone says, if I get the opportunity, or if she says no, I'm going to give her the Rehypnol. Right, so right. I'm not sure whether he's going to carry out the rapes or not. So I, and imagine all the people are like this. So I sell Rehypnol to all these people. So uh, liability clear in that case. To process that within my uh, discussions, which is not, this is a point for my next project, is to think about the sorts of weapons to have some sort of uh, tripartite relationship between weapons type, international crime type, and, oh, I've forgotten the, third, the third, third variable. At any rate, the point is that nuclear weapons will follow a different dynamic in this scenario to a handgun or ammunition. Um, and they will follow different dynamics depending on whether we're talking about rape or murder or deportation or other sorts of crimes. So I'm trying to move away from thinking of just the handgun and just the murder and try and think about the harm weapons produced in a much more dynamic fashion. And I think your arguments certainly hold for things like nuclear weapons. If you're producing nuclear weapons and suddenly one's detonated that you, that you sold somebody, it's fairly obvious that that's the almost only use that a nuclear weapon could be put to. Um, and there are other weapons that follow that trend also. I'm sorry, I interrupted. So my thought was just saying something like, well, it's going to make, think about all these different things that might make a difference. It might be that the gravity of the crime is going to make a difference. Um, it's going to make a real difference whether the thing that I provide um, provides some benefit as well as some cost. Right. And then, so if it's overdetermined and I'm not intending the crime to be committed and there's a benefit that I'm getting out of it, and there's no cost overall because were I not to provide the thing someone else will, like in the baseball bats example, right. then quite often my act's going to be permitted, I think. In the case where it's not overdetermined, so I'm making an increase in the number of deaths that are caused by creating these baseball bats because, say, the mob just wouldn't kill anyone were it not for yeah. the availability of my shiny bats, then I think it might be wrong for me to produce the bats and I should stop. But that's counterfactual dependence. So that's counterfactual dependence. So whether it's overdetermined or not, it's going to make a real difference about whether I'm permitted to. You seem to mm. rule out overdetermination as if that doesn't make any difference, but it makes a real difference, I think, to what I'm allowed to do. That's not to say that it's always decisive. Right. But you do as if it doesn't make any difference, and that seems clearly wrong to me. It's got to make a difference. That's very helpful. I, I like I like what you're you're doing in, in two directions. Um, you're inviting me to see more nuance in both overdetermination and recklessness, which I think is helpful, um, rather than seeing them as sort of catch-all phrases that may capture everything that I'm interested in. So that's helpful. Thanks. Chris, all right. Here's a, a, a question. I, so I, I've read a, a little bit of the international criminal law theory literature on these issues, and something that struck me is that, uh, and it's a bit oblique to your paper, but I might help me think a bit further about what you're arguing. Some people, some and, and here I'm referring to Jens Holden, for example, seems to fold complicity and vicarious liability or vicarious responsibility right. into each other. Right? They seem to think there's something that is, that is very similar between the two. And in the case of vicarious uh, liability, you might think that uh, the causation is not what really matters, and, and your mental state is not necessarily what matters either. It's, it's the nature of your relationship and presumably the benefits that you get out of your relationship. Uh, so I'm wondering whether 
you would allow for some cases which don't fit under a complicity paradigm, yet where we have the intuition and some people might, might want to work them into complicity, yet it's something different, right? It's something that you want to say, well, we're going to hold them responsible for the wrong, wrongs of others given their position vis-a-vis -vis that wrong, but it's not complicity, right? So uh, this relates to um, this relates to, to some of the, the issues that uh, I explored within this attempt to articulate what I conceived of to be as a a, um, a defensible notion of complicity. And I think that the overarching concern which animates so much of the discussion in international criminal law is guilt by association. Right. Um, and I think the concern is that if it's not complicity and a defensible notion of complicity, it collapses into guilt by association and it collapses into a liberal notion of punishment um, that can't be justified um, on first principles, I think. And certainly I, I have this quote that I start this um, start my work on, on complicity with. It's a quote by Eichmann just before he goes to the gallows. And Eichmann says... Something like, um, I can't help but think that I'm being punished here for the glass that others have broken. Right. And I love the quote because Eichmann's using it as saying this is fundamentally unfair, right? But the point is, you can be punished for the glass other people have bo broken under certain circumstances. And between these, the, these two relationships of fundamental unfairness, by gr guilt by uh, association, and some defensible notion of uh, assistance which plays a causal relationship in terms of the consummation of the final offense, there is a middle ground, and I think the middle ground must be complicity. So I'm deeply skeptical of notions like joint criminal enterprise, which are very dominant within international criminal law. Um, I'm skeptical of those, and I'm skeptical of their origins in domestic uh, felony murder and, and all of these other things, I guess, joining a long list of people who share those sentiments. Um, let me think, suggest one other solution that may touch on, on your ideas, and that is this tendency and among another, a number of jurisdictions and victims touched on it, to have criminal facilitation crimes. So you set up a crime which you say, which you say Victor Bout is guilty of, of criminal facilitation because he sold weapons to Angolans and potentially these are Angolans um, use them for crimes. And so, Victor Bout, we hold you responsible and la label you a facilitator of crime, as distinct from, or the, the, the Zyklon B case is better, we hold you responsible as facilitators of crime, the people who sold Zyklon B. But for me, that f if causation matters to responsibility, that fails to capture that what they caused was a genocide. You, you, you know what I mean? So there's, there's a miscommunication here. It's a little bit, I say, a little bit like holding somebody, it's even worse than holding somebody who actually committed murder responsible for attempted murder. At least in the, that scenario, murder features somewhere in the label um, used to brand the criminal. But in this scenario, criminal uh, facilitation, it, it doesn't even, it doesn't go to the heart of the real significance of what your facilitation actually enabled. Um, that said, I, I, one of the comments that I heard received earlier today at UFC was helpful, saying, if I can't resolve this general specific problem in recklessness, then maybe criminal facilitation is a, is a solution for that. If, if the mental element is never adequately calibrated to what's taking place in these sorts of circumstances, then maybe this lesser offense, because we know selling weapons to Angola at the time is, I mean, it's an unspeakable moral transgression, right? Unbelievable moral transgression. Um, so we have to have something to capture that moral responsibility, even if we can't establish in a concrete way quite why we know it to be a, an unspeakable moral transgression. Um, so that I, 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 does that touch on your so, thoughts? So let's imagine a case of an, an, an army uh, officer who, or somebody high up in the jurisdiction, in the, in the military, who is responsible for a number of soldiers, uh, equips them, trains them to the best of his uh, capability, and he knows that you know, it's 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 very likely that they're gonna go out and kill only unjust warriors, right? Yeah. This is and 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 really, it, it's not reckless to send them out because the yeah. risk is 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 they they have this unjust warrior sort of right. radar right. that is gonna 
find them. And, and it turns out that they indeed do. Some, somebody, it, it, it misfires, right? Yeah. So, and, 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 and you want to ask the question then, is there, is there anything that ties this man to what happened there? Not only in terms of, you know, ought to contribute to compensate him, right? Which is more of a, what we would think about employer responsibility in, right. in the civil law. But to, 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 to de this issue of liability, right? He, he did provide the weapons. Is that, is that, is that enough? Right for, for for liability as opposed to as opposed to guilt for for him for, for things to be done to him mm. right such that this could be prevented for example. Um, so I think I have I think I have quite conservative views on this. I think I have quite conservative views because I'm sort of. Um, following in a very rigid way, I guess, the, the heart idea that um, no matter what the purpose of your criminal justice system, that in individual instantiations, that, that there's no transgression, there's no movement beyond the principle of guilt. And when I look to what the how we measure the principle of guilt, it strikes me that we have to look to the crime with which the individual will be convicted in order to measure culpability, right? And so um, my fear, this field, is. The, the, there are many doctrines that attempt to do precisely what you're describing. One is called superior responsibility, where you punish the superior for the, the crimes of the subordinate, where they pr fail to prevent or punish. There's joint criminal enterprise, where we say, if there was a common plan, you become responsible for foreseeable consequences and all of these sorts of things. Um, I, I, I can't see how these doctrines are consistent with Hart and Wall's basic idea um, about culpability and the need to look to the crime with which they'll be convicted of to ascertain what the dimensions of culpability are. So um, I'm, I, I'm a bit conservative in that sense where I, I just feel like, listen, the international criminal courts and tribunals should stop doing these sorts of things of inventing these very invent, or not inventing, borrowing these very permissive, um, dubious, potentially liberal doctrine from domestic systems um, that are born largely out of a crime control agenda and just focus on a very consistent basic model of blame attribution which in some way harmonizes all the massive variations that there are within the national but, systems. But the fact that the, the, the general doesn't have to himself go out there and fight is because there are soldiers who are doing it from him. So in a sense, the right. general benefits a great deal from what they're doing. True. Right? So, so and, and, and that, that factor doesn't, doesn't cause you to think, well, there, there needs to be something to say. Well, these guys sitting in an armchair need to be rounded up somehow. In, uh, so, uh, in the ambit of the, 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 the criminalization, if you will. I think they do if they make a causal contribution. Let me add one more dynamic in the international context, which I think speaks uh, to issues that are very in interesting about complicity. So what's fascinating about it, because if you're in international criminal law, you have to be engaged in a comparative project. There's no other way of moving. But what's fascinating is that this really, this intense miscommunication between German criminal theory and Anglo-American criminal theory about complicity. Anglo-American theory assumes um, what German criminal theorists would call uh, an objective theory of perpetration. An objective theory of perpetration is the person who is actually swinging the machete is the perpetrator and the higher up is an accomplice. But if there's one idea that has produced such a tremendous doctrinal inconsistency and theoretical discussion in this discipline since its inception over the last 20 years, it's this problem like, yeah, but is the accomplice, is, is really the, the general who orders this, is he an accomplice? Isn't he or she more responsible? And these people who are following orders are overdetermined. And, um, you know, sure, this person was swinging a machete, but certainly somebody else would have swung the machete if it wasn't for them. And therefore, um, shouldn't we reverse that and call the person giving the order the perpetrator and the other person the accomplice? But is it meaningful to call them an accomplice? Part of what I'm trying to do is say, get over that distinction between perpetrators and accomplices. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't capture what is really important in, in moral responsibility, which is largely causal contribution plus the moral, blameworthy moral decision required of the offense with which they'll be convicted. Now, that doesn't go to, obviously, over-criminalization debates and whether some of these uh, crimes should be crimes at all. But my sense is if we're interested in the general in your scenario and other people, then we need to be interested in the extent to which they're making important causal contributions to crimes. And that 
beyond that, everything becomes a little bit um, abstract in an unproductive, in an unproductive way, um, and in a distracting way, ultimately. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Yeah. Sir Priya. I'm coming to this as a complete novice that hasn't really thought about these issues, so maybe I'm, I'm, I don't know. I'm, but, so you say the, the, the real important thing is, is causal contribution, uh, and your examples were of the, so the person who provides the detonator, the gun. Uh, what about the person who provides food? Um, the person who provides the uh, car in the case of someone who has a gun. So, so would you extend your story? They do. They also make a cause of contribution. That's one question. A second is um, so. In many countries, there is a crime of uh, negligent homicide or or causing death negligently. Um, would you um, so so here you can have a case in which the person who sells the cars has recklessness or has a some kind of virtual knowledge, the oblique intention, right. um, with regard to the fact that if you sell a thousand cars or ten thousand cars, there will be someone who will drive negligently and cause death as a result. So, so in right. some respects, the person who sells the cars has higher men's or higher men's rare than the, right, right. than the person who commits the crime. So, so how do you deal with that? And finally. And perhaps that's not the right place to ask this question, but, but I'll ask it anyway. I don't know. So uh, is there really a difference here with regard to international? So, so what does the international do in this story? So is, is, sh should there be? Uh, so is it this, the severity of the crimes that we're talking, that we're hardly ever talking about genocide in the context of domestic criminal law? Uh, whereas we do in the context of international criminal law, or, or is there anything else uh, in the sense that why should there be a difference between the two? Um, and so and the third one is, I, I admit, sort of more of a kind of uh, general question about this topic, so you, you're free to ignore it. If, if no, it's a great question. Let me start with that first. So um, my project is to try and, first and foremost, develop a defensible notion of complicity and think about the way it intersects with business. There's no necessary division between the international and the national. I'm most interested in this project because I'm most interested in things international generally. Um, um, and I'm, I'm, that's my background and those are my sorts of interests. But I, I'm also interested in the domestic component of it. I mean, one of the, this paper, one of the ways that I'm thinking of couching it is, you know, there are from what I can see, two jurisdictions in the world that have purpose as a standard. One is the US Model Penal Code. Canada is a little bit strange because it has purpose, but it boils down to knowledge. Um, the other one is the International Criminal Court, which followed the, US, the Model Penal Code and in fact instantiated a position which is even stronger than the US Model Penal Code. Both of those understandings are intense outliers globally. And um, so part of what I'm interested in is uh, under certain normal defensible notions that this could be really very relevant in with domestic gun violence in the United States and elsewhere too. So uh, the, the fact that I'm interested in things international is only because um, of my own, the other competing side of my brain which is interested in international the law. The general theory account that you're developing you would think would be roughly or equally applicable to both Yes, yeah, yeah, very much. I mean, so, so there's, okay. So, but yeah, that's the that's central idea. Can I, I'm sorry, my brain's full. I've done a little bit too much flying and thinking today. The first question um, was... <laughs> <laughs> um, the first question was on, I remember the second. The, uh, the first one was... Food. The second. Food, great, 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 food. So, food, yes, food, cars, uh, any. So, a little backstory before I answer the question directly. The strange thing about the criminal theorists is Providing a weapon is the second most popular illustration of complicity liability within when you're just having a narrative, right? Uh, the first popular, most popular is actually something that I sometimes wonder whether it is complicity at all, and that is the getaway driver in a bank. Um, it strikes me that so often that's co-perpetration. Um, complicity, the second favorite is providing a weapon. And I think it's the second favorite example 
because its causal impact is relatively clear in many instances and easily traceable. If I eat food before I go and rob a bank, the causal impact of the food is much less easy to establish. But No, I can, of course, tell the story properly such that... No, it's that an important problem. It's an important problem. Um, I, I don't mean to discount it. Uh, so my sense is that the way most legal systems will uh, address this is under the rubric of legal causation, remoteness, and uh, contributions that are not sufficiently substantial. But that brings into, uh, uh, comes back a little bit to questions of causation that we've discussed, but brings in some very interesting qu questions about what is substantial uh, liability. Let me say a little bit more about that. So in the, again, the, the context of debates in the US Model Penal Code, they say, listen, the alternative to purpose is knowledge and making a substantial contribution, but we should feel okay about the substantial contribution um, given our tremendous anxiety about business. We should feel okay about it because almost all businesses are making overdetermined contributions and therefore their contributions are not substantial. Um, but that means that uh, there's no accomplice liability in instances where there is any overdetermination that can't be right. That can't possibly be right. So I, I, I do have some, a part of this project is an attempt to think more carefully about what substantial contributions could be as a placeholder. Uh, Michael Moore uses it as a placeholder and doesn't really elaborate on that, what that content of a substantial contribution is. My, my general conceptual concern is that if you could nominate what point, say point X on a continuum between A and Z is substantial, then in any given scenario you could just add one more person to the group and then suddenly the contribution of each individual would no longer be substantial. Um, what I find tremendously provocative in this, in this uh, debate, and I, I really it makes me think a great deal about this problem, is Derek Parfitt's very provocative idea that there should be no substantial contribution and that just membership, membership of the set should be sufficient for liability. Um, I've written a little bit about this in, in Overdetermined Atrocities. Um, I find Parfit's discussion of this in Reason and Persons so provocative because he points out what the consequences are of any alternative and they seem like they're pretty significant in a globalized world where um, large groups of entities frequently jointly occasion very significant harm. So it's a roundabout answer, but I think the, the easy answer is that for food and things of this sort, um, generally this is just washed out as not a substantial contribution. The more difficult answer is, but what is a substantial contribution? And that's part of this process that I'm hoping to explore in the next little while and, and to think carefully about. Um, question so, two. So a car to get to, to, to land a car, not to be a, the driver that gets you there, you, you treat it in exactly the same way? Uh, I think the, the causal force of the car is clearer than the causal force of the food. I didn't tell the story of the food properly, but okay, fine. But okay. But but I think you're right to point to point your finger on the fact that substantial seems like a fairly slippery concept, and um, how we are going to pass. I mean, this is the problem of legal causation, though. I mean, legal causation is in both in in, in many jurisdictions is, is people just decry as being hopelessly imprecise and giving judges the power to impressionistically exclude causal factors that may or may not have been a problem. Um, it's a, it's a good it's a good problem. Um, I, I struggle with it. In the just war theory literature, quite a lot of people think that um, those people that provide food to the unjust side or provide arms to the unjust side or provide health care to the unjust side are liable to be killed. Right. That's not an uncommon argument. To make. Right. Thank you, Father Dave. It's sad. Oh. <laughs> it's, right. it's, it's, it's done. It's done. It's, it's done. done. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> I mean, so there's a question about whether. So, <laughs> <laughs> Give me that thing. <laughs> so, um, uh, so think about the, the the arms and then the food and then um, the healthcare. As people discriminate between these, well, I, I like to discriminate against between these things a little bit. Some people say, look, if you're going to hold people liable for providing arms, you've also got to be held liable for providing food or healthcare. Right. Part of the answer to that, I think, goes a bit like this. Um, so you've got the person who is 
um, fighting for the unjust side, and if you provide them with food or health care, they're going to get back onto the battlefield. If you provide them with a gun, they're going to get back onto the battlefield and shoot someone with the gun. You can imagine over-determined examples or non-over-determined right. examples. Um, let's just hold that neutral for the moment, not, not to establish which one we're talking about. Um, one of the differences between the food and the healthcare case and the guns case is goes back to what I thought about earlier. Um, that if I provide the person with the gun, they may not end up shooting someone with the gun. But if they use the gun at all, they're going to use it to shoot someone. And that makes a real difference to whether I should be held liable. Now, in the food and the healthcare case, if I provide food and healthcare to a person, that person is going to be cured and survive. Mm. And they may go and kill someone or they may not. And if they don't, the food and the health care is going to extend their life. So it's going to do a good mm. providing them with the food or the health care. What, what if you know that they're going to get back on the Yeah, that, that was the right. example that I was imagining. So in many, cases, in many cases, I'm uncertain about whether the person is going to get on the battlefield. But even if they get onto the battlefield, what we know about soldiers is that many of them don't fire. Something like 70% of soldiers on the battlefield never fire their weapon. They just wander so around kind of the battlefield. It's a question of risk, then. Right, so it's always a question of risk, because even if you okay. know they're going to get back on the battlefield, you don't know they're going to make an actual contribution to anyone's death. Lots of people just don't fire their weapons in the course of a war. And, and so, so, but how does that not get back to their gun? You might give them a gun knowing that the only reason they would use it is to kill somebody, but, exactly. but, but most people will not use a gun on the battlefield. Exactly, but the only reason to feed to give them the gun is for them to go and use it on the battlefield. Now, I can, when, I, when I'm providing the health care, I can think to myself, Okay, so there's a seventy percent chance they're going to get on the battlefield and kill someone. So I've got a, I've got a, 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 a chance that I'm going to be contributing to this unjust um, death. Mm. But if they don't go and do this, then the, the the food and the healthcare are independently beneficial. Whereas with the gun, I can't say that I've got this chance that they're going to go and kill someone unjustly on the battlefield. And if they don't, the gun that I provided them with was useless to anything else that's good, so I can't appeal to the benefit. Well, it's there for them. Self-defense. Self-defense, yeah, that's right, exactly but, so. But if there's a chance of self-defense, then there's more justification for me to provide the gun, though. That seems like a good case now. So imagine the case where the person, I'm unsure whether they're going to fight on the just or the unjust side, and I provide them with a weapon. That's easier to justify. They may be used it for self-defense, they may use it unjustly to attack, and I say, okay, so... Perhaps it's justifiable for me to provide can, them with the weapon in that case. Can I suggest something that, that I think may be the more appropriate place to, to locate these sorts of concerns, and it flows very directly from your language, uh, as justifications? Because, for instance, in the very famous English case in Gillick, you know, this is a case where um, the doctors are being, in a civil capacity, but complicity looms large, where doctors are being said to be complicit in statutory rape because they're providing contraception to underage children. And there's all of this tremendous gymnastics uh, intellectually to try and create standards of complicity that absolve the doctors because their motives are noble. They are attempting to prevent STDs in, in young people and unwanted pregnancies. But most of people who, who comment on this now say, well, actually, the doctors are most certainly complicit, as are people providing needles in um, safe needle places, in the illicit use of, of drugs, potentially. But the place to process these concerns is as justifications. And it strikes me that a lot of what you're doing is talking about um, balance of evils and, and uh, issues of this sort. Um, and it's important because so many of these intuitions about complicity tend to, and there was just a decision in the international realm two weeks ago that did precisely this, they tend to corrupt the core notion of complicity because the intuitions about what is and is not justified um, are front loaded into the first uh, paradigmatic aspect of what complicity constitutes. Victor's approach might be the question is, is it permissible or not? And if you're going to make that move, then that right. wrongdoing and justification are both part of the inquiry, right? So, well, it's so, a question so, about what we should call pro tanto wrong, but justifying right, what we should right, call right. not pro tanto wrong. Sure. Some of these cases look more plausible as not pro tanto wrong, and some of them look more plausible as pro tanto wrong, but justified. So think about the, um, the firing squad case with duress. I talked about this in... Um, uh, a talk last week is the Ademovich case. So the person acts under duress and uh, participates in a firing squad. And kills. I know the case well, yeah. So um, this looks like it's pro tanto wrong, but justified, assuming that right. none of the other conditions of duress are undermined. Right. So that might be a justified duress um, case. In the case where the person manufactures cars knowing that some people are going to use them as getaway cars, it looks like it's not even pro tanto wrong to sell cars. 
So imagine I sell a bunch of cars, and I know that some of those cars are going to be used as getaway cars. I have no idea who's going to use them as getaway cars, just a general mm. selling of cars. I'm just Ford or whatever. I mean, you mm -hmm. not say that Ford are pretend wrong right. in selling cars, you know, because some of them are going to be used as getaway. I mean, that seems... So, but then exactly how we draw this Why? distinction between justified... Well, you, No, I, I mean, I agree right. with you, right? I'm not but so how... <laughs> So how should, how should we discriminate between things that are pro tanto wrong but justified and things that are just permissible and there's no pro tanto wrong? Um, that's a tough question, and we need a theory of that, and no one's got a good one. I so agree, I and just for to say. clarity, though, I also so, don't so think that... that goes that... to my second question, right? And, and so maybe I got it wrong, but if I got you right, then you try to say um, you're kind of equating the mental element of the perpetrator and that of the... Uh, accomplice, uh, the complicit person. And, and I gave you an example in which, in some respects, the mental element of the right. car seller is more Culpable. stronger, right? So, so the example I gave was not to be used as a getaway car, but to use for negligent homicide. And so, right. so, 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 yeah. It's a good problem. Uh, it's a good problem. So, um, and I'm thinking of all those sort of uh, paradigmatic examples of people who instigate self, someone to attack them so they can kill them. Where you know that it's not quite parallel, but where your actual mental element exceeds that of um, your mental element is culpable and exceeds that which is uh, applicable within the paradigm that the criminal law will afford you. So I think it's a good example where, for instance, the arms vendor sells you a weapon and their purpose is to facilitate a genocide, knowing that there's only a probability that it will result and the person actually uses the weapon that furthers the genocide but only recklessly. So those are sorts of interesting problems. I think what a, a unitary theory of perpetration will do is that it will not hold the individual responsible for genocide but for the lesser crime. Um, and but sentencing might have I wonder if that's a liberal, though. I wonder if that's permissible, but, that if you can escalate I, 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 based on... I suspect in my car example, most people would say, just like Victor said, that there would be no liability for the car seller, because that's my example. The example is Ford selling cars in, the, in large enough numbers, knowing right. that You're for up. sure some of them will cause, will end up, uh, will be involved in, in, in car accidents in which someone will be negligent. So will perhaps go to prison for, for uh, negligent homicide. So I'm, I'm agreeing um, with Victor, although I still want to do more work. I'm agreeing with you in the sense that I'm agreeing that there is interesting discussions about what gets front-loaded as pro tanto and what is subsequent in terms of justification. I agree entirely. Um, still, though, I'm interested to what extent the mental element will actually capture that dynamic in the pro tanto formulation. I don't think it's so simple to say Ford is automatically an accomplice in those sorts of scenarios. I think part of the work that I'm hoping to do in recklessness in particular is to think about how that functions in these broad generic risks um, where there is no real appreciation of what the specificities of the instantiation will look like. So um, I'm still skeptical about the extent to which we get Ford at the front end. I think that really can't be meaningful if it's if you're saying dangerous things make the manufacturer or vendor ipso facto responsibility responsible for all subsequent um, crimes, that is blank check responsibility, and it seems uh, perverse. It would shut down industries. Though you did say you shouldn't allow capitalism to overcome uh, to override. Nice point. Uh... Nice point. Maybe we should <laughs> shut down these industries. Good point. Um, so uh, you don't want to talk too much about the unitary theory, but I thought we'd talk about it. In just, just going back to one of, one of my examples earlier, so imagine that someone comes to me and they say, I really want to have sex with this woman because I've got a bet that I'll be able to have sex with her, and if I win the bet, I'm going to get this sum of money. Mm. And I think she might say yes, but I'm worried that she'll say no, so I want some rehypnol. So I, I give the rehypnol. Mm. So now I don't have an intention that the person will commit, that the person will have non-consensual sex. You have a conditional intent. I only have a conditional intent. I right. don't have a conditional intent. I have any intent. I right. just want to sell the Rehypno for the money. Right. And there's a risk that he'll go and have sex with her. Right. Without consent. You don't want to say that I'm not guilty of the rape in that case, do you? 
Why would I have to? Well, it's on your unitary theory, I need the mens rea of rape. Right. And I lack the mens rea of rape. I'm just reckless as to whether the person's going to have sex. No, yeah, it, it, it is an interesting problem. And I think I do want to say you're not guilty of rape. Ouch. But it, it's, I mean, it's like you're, you're just reckless. With the it, I mean, you know, what, what more do you need? <laughs> I mean, it looks really implausible to say I'm not guilty of rape in that case. No? Um, Francois says he wants to kill someone. Um, but he'll let him off if this person begs for forgiveness and gives him a million pounds. Um, Francois says, can I have a gun? So give him the gun. And the guy doesn't beg for forgiveness and give the million pounds so he Francois shoots him in the head. So I don't intend the person's going to be killed, but there's this like, really high chance he's going to be killed. Like, you know what I'm not guilty of murder. I wouldn't be guilty of... It's an interesting question. Uh, to, is what you're doing... Um, I like your conditional problematics. They're, they're interesting and, and difficult. Is what you're doing trying to plot a position between recklessness and intent? So there's two different kinds of recklessness. The recklessness as to whether the crime will be committed. Right. Um, with the, so the, the weapon's bought, I'm not sure whether it's bought in order to commit a crime or not. Right. Where it could be used for some other purpose. And that right. looks like the weaker case where I can see the unitary theory looks potentially kind of attractive. Right. But then these other cases where I sell the good, where the only reason why the good is being bought is to commit the crime, but, it's unsure, but I'm unsure whether the person will decide to go and carry it out. And in that case, the unity theory looks really implausible. Even though I'm only reckless, it looks like I should be right. held liable for the crime. Although one of the solutions might be... Okay. We'll ask the question at some point. Sure. Um, let me respond to this then. I'll, I'll respond. So in that instance, I think the, the solution that a unitary theory may adopt is to, is to involve the supplier in a lesser crime, like assault, where recklessness would be sufficient. But I, I take your point, and I had to have to give more thought about the sorts of um, bifurcated on-off options that you, that you mentioned, where um, it's very clear that if one option plays out, then this crime will take place. Um, it reminds me a little bit about, and this touches on the sorts of points you're making all about gravity, where um, you may want to calibrate this relationship differently, where the consequences especially grave. So for instance, uh, Russian roulette is a nice example, right? You have a, a chamber with eight rounds in it, you put one bullet in, and the question is, you know, you, you pull the trigger and there's only a one in eight chance that this person is going to die. It's not especially great, but there's no doubt your recklessness given the gravity of what happens if that one eighth takes place and how we calibrate those sorts of, how we integrate those sorts of problems within questions of culpable risk taking, I think is also a related and interesting problem. But thanks for that. I'm definitely going to think more. So we, we have a question from the, the camera. <laughs> I'm wondering if, uh, I think you touched on this earlier when you were talking about weapons specifically, but if the products, the, the company's design, like the product's design could play a role in this, especially with Ford. Like, if they started putting spikes on the front of their cars to make collateral damage more painful, or if they started inserting police scanners and marketing as the perfect getaway vehicle then they could definitely be held accountable in the same way that a gun manufacturer theoretically could be for selling to a uh, dangerous country. So couldn't that be part of the defining factor? Like if brohypnol had a secondary purpose, I think everyone's been dancing around mm -hmm. this a lot, like if brohypnol had a secondary purpose, it was also, you know, like a drug someone took to sleep. Right. Like if it was just like a lot of people bought it because they wanted to sleep mm. and they had insomnia, mm. then the liability could be loosened on that. Mm. Because the Rohypnol's sole purpose, I think that has come I, up a lot. But. I, I'm with you, and I think that the answer to that is, is one that we touched on earlier, that some weapons are just prohibited. Like, if you're, and there, this is where the cases really happen. I mean, the Netherlands recently prosecuted one of their own nationals for providing 1,100 tons of chemical precursors to Saddam Hussein. And an amazing case where they traced the causal, $21 million to investigate, they caught, traced the causal passage of these chemicals all the way from Japan and Switzerland all the way into Iraq and trace them into the bodies of individuals um, and they took uh, quantified the amount of chemicals that were involved and measured the quantity in tanks in Iraq and established that there was an 80% chance or that, uh, that established it first 
that the, these chemicals were definitely those used in bombing in chemical warfare against Iraqi Kurds and in Iran. And then, you know, the only, and then wheeled in experts to say the only possible use of these chemicals in this quantity is mustard gas. Um, this individual is an expert in you know, chemicals of this sort. Voila! Complicit in war crimes, but not genocide because he didn't have the specific purpose I mentioned. Precisely the dynamic that I'm arguing. So uh, I think you're on the money in the sense that um, these dynamics will play out differently for weapons that are in inherently prohibited, like chemical weapons, even nuclear weapons. I mean, people, there's this big debate in international law where about, about whether they're inherently pro prohibited, but part of my argument is, listen, have your debate, but in 99.999% of instances where they're detonated, it will am amount to an international crime. So um, I think the dynamics are much clearer in those types of situations, and, and the, the potential complicity is, is much more apparent. Um, the reason for that, though, is you can appeal to the benefits of a case with a dual use. It's not because of dual use inherently. Right. It's because you can say, look, I sold this stuff, and here was the good reason to sell it, that people were using the retinol to go and sleep or whatever. And although it's true they were going to use it in this other way, had they not used it in this other way, they'd have used some other date rape drug. So that's, right. you know, that's over to turbid the result. Right. Where it's not, then often the, the good use is not going to be sufficient. So in the case where they wouldn't be able to get any other date rape drug if it wasn't for the retinol, I can't then say, Oh, but you know, they might have been using it for a sleeping pill. They might use it for date rape. You know, I mean, often yeah, yeah. you want to just say, well, yeah. look, you know, the risk is too great and you're going to contribute to rapes, which you could prevent if you weren't right. you were doing it. And so you, you ought not to tell us in that case, you're complicit if you do. Right. But I think that's what you want to appeal to, not the mere fact of whether the weapon's the prohibited type of weapon. It's rather whether right. there might be good purposes for the weapon. That's what's really interesting. Yeah, that's where the self-defense cases are interesting, where a person might use it for self-defense or might use it for the right. wrong thing, and then it looks like you might justify it if the chances of using it for self-defense are high enough. Let me say, let me say something about self-defense, because I do think about including it in this, uh, it's, uh, and I've done quite a bit of research to, to, front, uh, to consider that. In a way, I wonder whether self-defense isn't a strength of this paradigm and a strength of complicity, because the argument uh, in, in many places is, listen, people need weapons to defend themselves. And there are actually very compelling arguments along these uh, lines. Um, and part of what I'm interested in is, well, those types of arguments are interesting as blanket arguments. And in some instances, they're true. But at least by focusing on a complicity analysis, we undertake a, a, a questioning of that um, proposition on a case-by-case -case basis, instead of allowing it as a blanket justification for flooding particular contexts with weapons. So I, I wonder if the self-defense thing, I, I'm interested in the next little while to think about how self-defense will interface with these sorts of issues and how that might play out in a specific trial and what the dynamics might be in that relationship um, to ward off just generic assumptions that everyone should be, everyone has an automatic all the time right to self-defense, um, such that they need to acquire weapons. Um, so I haven't thought that through, but I, I'm interested in that relationship too. Okay. Any other questions? I'll go one last question. So here's one question. question. Can you, I wonder if you could talk about the idea of evidence, and because you mentioned that briefly before, and sort of one issue that seems to come up whenever we talk about dual use or even dual actors, I mean, you can have people that weapons can be used, say, in self-defense or legitimate purposes. This is a big issue during the Bosnia conflict. There was an arms embargo, and the Bosnians were saying, hey, we're being denied our right to self-defense. And sure, it may commit, they may commit atrocities once they get the weapons, but they needed them um, in that context. And it seems to me that one of the issues that arises when you talk about specific legislation as opposed to the sort of more general concept is that at least when it comes to specific legislation, you can establish a clear evidentiary basis for banning sales when it comes to arms vendors. Um, say more about what you mean by a clear evidentiary. Sorry, I, sh I shouldn't say a clear evidentiary base. I, you can you can you can establish a clear line, um, at which point arms vendors can say, well, it's clearly been laid out that we can't sell to these people. Um, whereas in the more general sense, in the absence of legislation, right. then it seems like you're asking them to do a lot of work on their end, in terms in terms of dif discovering what would or wouldn't be acceptable and who would or wouldn't be acceptable to sell what to. Um, two, two answers. So um, you take me for the first answer into the international realm, which is something I'm interested in. 
So it turns out that arms embargoes are largely counterproductive in terms of production of violence, that what happens is that frequently arms embargoes just change the dynamic between warring factions such that the other faction decides, well, there's an arms embargo in place now on the other side, therefore uh, we are going to pursue a military rather than a political solution, and arms embargoes tend to, um, to be highly criticized precisely because they have no net effect on, on violence. It's slightly peripheral, but the, the core uh, aspect of your question, I think, is about um, the extent to, no, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm fading a little bit, Asad, can you mention the first aspect? Sure, I'm just wondering um, if one of the benefits of having sort of specific legislation is that the vendors themselves don't ah, have to that's do that's right, so I'm sorry, they're, they're put on notice. So that is one of the important criticisms of the unitary theory, um, that it doesn't do enough work to establish the circumstances where an individual will be uh, on notice that they're engaging in criminal offences, offending, because they have to understand the whole plethora of international crimes and the mental elements within those crimes, and they also have to understand the causal power of their actions to generate. Um, so is recklessness, like I'm helping this person who's buying a weapon, and I'm helping them and I'm thinking, wow, well, if they go out and commit this war crime, recklessness is sufficient. But if it's genocide, then I have to have the purpose. And you're asking people to do that intellectual work. And, and in some jurisdictions in Italy, for instance, it has this unitary theory. Uh, a lot of academics question whether it is actually consistent with principles of legality to ask people to do that work. Um, that's an important debate. That said, I don't think there's too much work to be done when Hitler approaches you asking for chemical weapons to gas X number of million people. Um, I don't think there's too much work for Victor Bout to do when faced with a proposition of funding both sides in a civil war that is unbelievably brutal. Um, in a strange way, I think the moral intuitions are much more obvious than, the, say, the causal path pathways that we have to use to justify this in a criminal context. Um, so uh, part and part, I think to some extent you're, you're interested in an idea that ref is reflected in, in criminal theory and criminal practice. And on another level, I think in many instances, um, these issues aren't all that important. And let me backtrack a little bit because we're talking about an industry that has been unregulated in a spectacular way since time immemorial. I mean, in the Amnesty International's uh, War cry is bananas and coffee are more regulated than weapons. Um, so what I'm interested in this, in, in this project is to, to try and establish a clear sense of moral responsibility prior to notions of criminal responsibility in a way and say actually there are moral responsibilities in transferring weapons beyond just political expedience and things of this sort that have characterized the way weapons are sold for the longest time. So um, it touches on important issues. Thank you. Join me and thank you.